Union Gospel, are you all ready for another Sunday School lesson? There's only one way to be saved, and it is not by adhering to the law. You must be saved by faith. In this lesson, we're going to find out what was Paul actually talking about and what does that look like. There are notes for this lesson. I'll leave a link in the description below and in the comments section. I'll leave a link above my head. Click that link right there above my head. Get your notes, your Sunday school books, and your Bibles. For the Union Press Sunday School is now in session. Hurry up, join me. We late. Let's go. Join me. Let's go. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sunday School Lesson as taught by Pastor Rodney Jones. I'm the pastor of the New Nation Anointed Ministries Church of God in Christ. We're located 1700 West 87th Street in the city of Chicago. Our zip code is 60620. Welcome to you new subscribers and thank you for subscribing to this channel. If you have not subscribed, just take a moment, hit that subscribe button below. The subscribe button is only to let you know that we are uploading our lessons. It is not a charge to subscribe. It is a free subscription. Make sure you click that bell notification beside it and click the word all so that YouTube will notify you through your email. Bing is late. But Brother Jones finally uploaded another Union Gospel lesson. We got a good one on today. Oh my goodness, on today we are dealing with saved by faith. And this is the Union Press Sunday School lesson. We're in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, verses 1 through 10. And happy birthday to those of you all whose birthday is May 16, 2021. Very interesting lesson. In this lesson, Paul breaks down justification. Now, you're going to find out that there is a word that shows up a lot in this lesson, and that word is righteousness. Righteousness is a valuable key word, and we're going to bring that definition up. Another word for righteousness would be justification. God justified us. I need you to know that we are not righteous. We have been declared righteous by God. And in this lesson, we're going to see where Paul's concern was for the children of Israel. And he said that they had a problem. He expresses what his problem is with them, but he tells them how to get out of it. We're going to talk about this righteousness of faith, righteousness of the law, and righteousness of what this, the, the children of Israel call themselves doing. It's very difficult. But we're going to go into some stuff and then we're going to break down Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 9 through 10, which is the lesson that we constantly have people to repeat. And there's one word in there called confess that I think we need to re-look at that word confess. We might be doing something that's not so good in the eyes of God. Let's get right into the reading of this lesson. There it is. Romans the 10th chapter verses 1 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Which brings us to our first word and that word is the word desire. It means to have a longing or it means goodwill or a gracious purpose and good pleasure. Now, he said his heart's desire and his prayer. Now, this word prayer is not your normal prayer. This word prayer here means to make known one's particular need or, or one's want. It is a supplication for a particular benefit. It means, and what Paul is really saying, is the good pleasure which stemmed from his heart was for Israel. This stemmed from his heart 
because he was having a problem with the children of Israel. And I need to let you know that we all ought to have a concern for our fellow brother, a family member, a non-family member, whatever the case may be. We ought to always have a concern about their salvation. He does not mention their financial status or their physical, but he mentions a concern for their spiritual status. Paul preached hard to save Israel. He was deeply concerned about their salvation. He was also beaten by them, yet he loved them. 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25. He himself was an Israelite of the stock of Benjamin. That's Philippians the third chapter and fifth verse. He longed for Israel for them to be saved from their sins. And in this day and time, many people will say, would you judge me? How do you know that I'm not saved? Your action tells us or says whether you are or are not. Bible gives us plenty of examples of what salvation looks like. Problem is, in this day and time, we use the scapegoat of don't judge me. And as a consequence, many are dying and going to hell. So the reason they are not saved is because simply they rejected the gospel message. I need you to know that as we preach the gospel, we have been given one mandate by Jesus Christ. Everything else is extra. The mandate is to preach Christ and him crucified. If we add anything else, it's extra. In other words, we cannot go through life giving people the dessert. We've got to go through life giving them the meat and the root and the basics of the gospel, which every preacher has been given the mandate to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything else is extra bonus is what I'm saying. And the reason they're not saved because they rejected not only just the gospel of Jesus, but they rejected Jesus. They did not accept him. Even Paul says the preacher and the Christ or the fact that Christ was being crucified, it was a stumbling block to them that would be 1 Corinthians, the first chapter and the 22nd verse. He says, uh, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Notice that word bear record and zeal. They have a zeal of God, but their zeal that they have of God is not according to knowledge. Before I go into this, I need you to know that God is the one who designs and says what worship looks like. He's the one who says this is what he accepts. And just because we do it doesn't mean that God accepts it. Just because it feels good, sounds good, tastes good to the flesh, to the soul's desire in the name of worship does not mean that God says that he's accepting it as worship. In this lesson, Paul says his desire for them is that they might be saved. Now, he says, I bear them record. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. The problem is that their zeal of God is not according to knowledge. So after expressing his longing for his people and prayer to God, he gives his reasons. As a Jew, Paul knows their actions from experience. He, being a Jew, knows what their shortcomings are as Jews. The Jews didn't like Paul because he preached Christ and him crucified. He says, my longing is, or my desire, is that they might be saved. He said, now I bear them record. That I bear them record. And the word bear record is one in the Greek. It means to be a witness and to testify to be a witness and to testify. So Paul says he can testify to the fact that they have a zeal of God. He is a true witness of their zeal, but the problem is their zeal of God is not according to knowledge. Even Paul had a zeal of God. That's Philippians the third chapter, verses six through 10. He had the same zeal. He was in the same boat. So he understands exactly where they are. Paul being saved can see that Israel is not saved because they are still following the law. We're going to talk about this law in a few minutes. They are following the law because they have rejected Jesus. And the Bible said that he came to his own and his own received him not. That's the first chapter of the book of John verses 11. 
Point number six is I can testify that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. And the word zeal means to be hot, to be hot. It's an excitement of mind, fervor of spirit, or even enthusiasm. Many don't really understand Technically, the word enthusiasm is a word that really is inspired by God. So he says they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. The word knowledge means recognition or full discernment, precise and correct knowledge. I got to say something. If you really don't know God, it's very difficult for you to fully worship God if you don't know him. If you don't know Jesus Christ, it's difficult to fully worship someone you have a have knowledge of. If you have a have knowledge, you may not be walking truly or fully in the path that he says to walk in. So they have an excitement for God, but they lack a full discernment of God. They know the law and try to force Gentiles to follow the law. That's Acts the 15th chapter. They thought salvation was in following the law. That's Galatians 2 and 16. And they rejected the fact that the only way to be saved is to have faith in Christ. They rejected the easy way and they continue to move the hard way. I got to say this to somebody. This is my let me holler at you camera. Uh, we've got to be very careful of how many things we tell people to take off in this day and time. I come up from an era where it was what we don't do. And when you got through, you stripped the individual and gave them all of what you can't do. And what we end up doing was we took the law and we placed it on an individual and we bogged them down with the law rather than giving them the gospel. And if there's anything that needed to be changed, then the gospel of Jesus Christ, once they receive it, he will bring conviction into the heart and thereby give them a new nature and they will cease. They will become a new creature and the things that are not godly, they're going to change anyhow. But we couldn't wait. We wanted to change them. And this is what the Jew did. The Jew didn't understand. And I'm going to show you that this law was temporary. Two things. The law was temporary and the law was not given to the Gentiles. I said it and I'm going to keep on going with it. So they rejected the gospel message. That's Acts the 18th chapter verses 3 through 4. Because Israel didn't understand the purpose of the law. Therefore, they rejected the gospel. Yes, I'm going to show you the purpose of the law. I'm going to show you the tenure of the law. And I'm going to show you what the law did, what it was for. We're going to talk about that in a, a few more minutes. And it's coming up. Don't you dare touch that dial. Come on up in here. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness... And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They being ignorant. Now he's given a reason why he says that they are not saved. First of all, he says because they don't really, they have a zeal of God, but their zeal of God is not according to knowledge, not according to the full understanding of who God is and what he requires. And so they been ignorant, ignorant of God's righteousness or the things that God accepts as right. They've been ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish. Now watch that word establish. I'm going to show you that it doesn't mean what you think that it means. They are to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of of God. So notice the word righteousness is mentioned in this verse alone three times. And I'm teaching the uh, class on Thursdays at the local church. I teach the evangelists, the ministers, and all of those uh, how to study the scriptures. That's from 630 to 715. We break it down. I'm going to say this. Stop making Bible studies so complicated. We make the Bible study very difficult and complicated. No, don't make it complicated. And so we break it down to where it's not so complicated. And one of the things we bring up is watch repeated words. That word righteousness is repeated in this one verse three times. They've been ignorant of the righteousness of God or God's righteousness. They went about to establish their own righteousness and they have not submitted unto the righteousness of God. 
So that's a key word. That's a key word that's important to understand what Paul is really referencing. So number two is Paul now explains in more detail what God accepts or what he calls uh, righteousness and why he said that they are not saved. Number one, he says they're ignorant as to what God accepts or calls righteousness. Uh, they reject, number two, his way through ignorance of his true way. And they seek after or they establish their own righteousness, which is unacceptable to God. Therefore, causing them not to submit themselves unto his righteousness. Now, he says that they were ignorant of God's righteousness. And that word ignorant means to not know or not understand. They didn't understand the righteousness of God. And the word righteousness is the character or quality of being right or just. Righteousness deals with the condition acceptable by God, accepted as righteousness. It is God that determines what is right. And another word for righteousness is justice or justification. So there are three references that Paul deals with as it relates to righteousness. The righteousness of God, the righteousness of the law, and the righteousness of faith. Then the extra bonus is their own righteousness. I'll say that again. The righteousness of God, the righteousness of the law, and the righteousness of faith, or the righteousness which comes by faith. So which means prior to this, there was another way for them to be declared as righteous, and that's if they followed the law. But I'm going to show you that there was a problem with following the law and why. So they did not understand God's way of making people justified. And God is the only one who establishes the terms of uh, and for righteousness. Any other way of establishing righteousness is not acceptable by God. God determines what is acceptable in what we call worship. And if our worship or preaching does not line up with the way God says it ought to look, it is unacceptable. You can pop a sweat, you can blow a nerve vessel, and you can cut an umbilical cord. I don't know where that came from, uh, up here somewhere. You know, I, I, if you know me, this is my laryngitis right here. My laryngitis is always in my hand. And the problem is we create stuff in worship, in the name of worship. We call it worship. I got motorcycles all around. I'm not worried about them. But it's not acceptable to God. So he said this was done that the, the, the righteousness of God is the fact that he justified the guilty by faith. That's Romans, the fifth chapter, verses one. In other words, the only way to be justified by God is through faith. There are no works. There are no works in justification. That's why we sing the song, although we sing it wrong. Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. He didn't free me forever. He justified freely. Rising, he justified freely forever. That's what the song is. So his righteousness is re revealed through the gospel message. That's Romans 1 and 17. His righteousness was manifested through the blood of Jesus. Romans 3, 21 through 31. I'm going to stick with this righteousness for a little bit. And so God's righteousness is revealed in the gospel. That's Romans 1, 16 through 17, which means if we don't preach the gospel, then his righteousness is not revealed. If we do not preach the gospel, people will not hear it and open up their hearts and receive him. And I believe, and I got to say this, I believe that the enemy has infiltrated our churches and told the preacher to not preach the gospel. And therefore, many are not being saved. Uh, uh, many lives are not being impacted and changed. We bring all kinds of programs into the church, but we forgot that the main focus and purpose of the church is not programs, but it is the preaching of the gospel. I'm going to keep going. Point number eight. He said they were going about to establish their own righteousness. And the word going about means to seek 
in order to find or to strive after or to aim at. They were seeking to be acceptable to God by keeping the law. They believed adhering to the law even after Christ was acceptable by God. They didn't understand that the law pointed them to Christ. And since the law pointed them to Christ, that means the law was only temporary. The law, the Bible says, reveals sin. That's Romans, the third chapter in the 20th, 20th verse. And their own righteousness is the following of the law. That's Romans 3 and 9. So Paul says they went about establishing their own righteousness. That means that they were adhering to the law. That's all that simply means. I'll show you and I'll read Philippians 3 and 9. He says, and been be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So when it says that they went about establishing their own righteousness, that simply means that they were following the law and they thought that that was be acceptable unto God. He mentions the word established, which means to cause to stand, to abide, or to continue. So Israel thought that they could be righteous by remaining in the old law. They thought staying in and adhering to the Mosaic law was the righteous thing to do. And Paul told them that no man is justified by the works of the law. Galatians 2 and 16. Stop trying to do a work to impress God. You're wasting time. Salvation is the application of the work of Christ upon the believer. What Christ did on Calvary, all we have to do is believe it, accept it, and receive it, and allow him to change us. He says, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. That's Galatians, the third chapter and the 11th verse. Then he says that they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The word submitted means to place under or to place in submission. They don't feel the need to submit because they don't see nothing wrong. They're in a pure ignorance as to the righteousness of God. And in order for them to receive God's righteousness, they must submit. Verse 4 is where we're going to hang our head for just a little bit. Soon to show up. Oh, that's so beautiful. Now watch this. Read this very careful. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end. Christ is the end of the law. Let that sink a little bit. He is the end of the law. The key word would be the word in. He's the end of the law. Just think about the word in. Paul says their zeal of God is not according to knowledge. Uh huh. They practiced the law thinking it was what God accepted. Uh huh. And Paul enters into uh, the Mosaic law to further point his give his point concerning them. Notice how he talks about righteousness, then he brings in the law. He's bringing in the law for reason because the problem with Israel in this lesson is they rejected the gospel because they still have submitted themselves unto the law, which they couldn't fulfill it. And I'm going to show you what Peter said. So Paul is inserts the law while dealing with their seeking their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They are seeking their own righteousness, which is obedience to the law. He says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness or for the purpose of being justified or for the purpose of being declared righteous by God. It that wasn't going to happen until Christ came. Christ here is the anointed. He is the Messiah. And Paul brings him in because the Jew don't like Christ. We're going to see this in a minute. We're going to possibly find out that what we've been doing with the book of Romans verses 9 and 10 may not be what we ought to be doing. Oh, come on, somebody. So he says he is the end, which means termination, completion, goal, or what the law was aiming for. 
He is the culmination. I'm going to read that again. Christ is the termination. He is the completion of the law. He is the goal of the law. He is what the law was aiming to. He is the culmination of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. He is the period of the law. I need somebody to get that in our heads that when he came here uh, and completed everything, that's it. We're going to show you in a minute. This first is going to take us some time. So put your seatbelts on and let's go. Christ is the fulfillment of the law for granting righteousness to those of faith. Those that have faith in Christ have been justified through his blood. What was the purpose of the law? It's the very, very good question. The Bible says it was added because of sin. That's Galatians, the third chapter in the 19th verse. The law was only added. Here it is. It was only added until I think I best to read that. Yeah, I'm going to read that. It's been a while since we opened up our Bible and read. And no, I didn't want to have it ready because I wanted to do it this way. Watch this. Galatians, the third chapter and the 19th verse. It says, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added. Notice the word, it was added. That means it was not part of the original. It was added because of transgressions. Watch this. Till the seed. That word T-I-L-L -L means that the law was not permanent. The law was temporary. And the law was given some 400 years after God made the promise and the covenant with Abraham. 400 some years later, he introduces the law because of sin. It was added because of sin, but it was added, the Bible says, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. That means the law was not permanent. My question is, why are we still practicing the law? Not only that, I'm going to show you in the lessons in a few minutes where the law was a shadow of things to come. Watch this. If the law was the shadow of Christ and Christ is here, why are we still following the shadow when the real man is here? I'm going to read this. So he came. Uh, uh, let me read it. So the law had a shadow of things to come. That would be Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 1 through 4. Then Christ came to fulfill the law, Matthew 5 and 17. But he says, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Matthew 5 and 18. Until. That means it's not permanent. He says, men could not be justified by the law, but by Jesus Christ. Acts 13 and 39. After faith came, there were no longer under a schoolmaster because the law was their schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. After faith came, there was no need for a schoolmaster, which was the law. That's Galatians 3 and 25. The law pointed to Christ. He was born under the law. That's Galatians 4 and 4, which is why when the men who had leprosy asked and said, if you will, we can be whole. And he willed it so, but then he told them to go show yourself to the priest. Because I hate to tell you all this, but while Jesus was alive, he was under the Old Testament law. And so there are some passages of scripture that we're struggling with that Jesus said, and we need to understand he was still under the law. I'm going to show you. So he willed that. That would be in Luke 17 and 4. Uh, the righteousness of God is witness. Watch this. The righteousness of God is witnessed by the law. The law spoke about it. And that's Romans 3 verses 21 through 22. And the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus unto all that believe. I'm standing here a minute on this righteousness and this law so we can move on. Romans 3 and 22. Christ became sin. The Bible says who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians 5 and 21. And that's without the law. 
And the law was the schoolmaster to bring the Jews, to bring the Jews, not the Gentiles. The law was the schoolmaster to bring the Jews to Christ. That's Galatians 3, verses 24 through 26. And Christ did what the law could not do to fulfill the righteousness of the law. That's Romans 8, verses 3 through 4. Let me keep on moving on. Verse 5 says, for Moses describeth, now that word describeth means written, it means writing or wrote. In other words, Moses wrote. Uh, so Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. He, Moses writes that the law's way of making a per person right with God requires obedience to it and obedience to all of its commands. They can and will only be made righteous if they fulfill the entire Mosaic law. The Bible says that if they break one part of the law, they're guilty of breaking it all. That's James 2 and 10. Uh huh. And, the, and Peter says, you can't put something, a yoke on us that we know our fathers were able to bear. That's Acts 15 and 10, because nobody could accomplish it but Jesus. And if they serve the law, they must live completely by the law, which is interesting. Let me holler at you. How do we turn some parts of the law on and some parts of the law off? You can't pick and choose what we're going to use. That rhymes. I'm a poet and didn't know it. You cannot pick and choose what part of the law that we're going to have people to live by on our own. Mm -mm, can't happen. And so what we need to do is stop setting our houses of worship like the Old Testament. I'm sorry. There are no Levites in the New Testament church. There are no priests in the New Testament church. There are no a whole lot of things that we have in the New Testament church. It ain't there. Jesus didn't put none of them in there. Come on, I'm going to keep moving. So it describeth, that Moses describes, he speaks about or he writes about the righteousness which is of the law, that if you're going to perform it by the law, you got to perform it all. Uh, Leviticus 18 and 5 says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am uh, the Lord. We're going to read verses 6. Verses 7 and verses 8. Boom, boom. But, now he just got through speaking of the righteousness of the law. He says, but the righteousness which is of faith. I need you to know that he's making a comparison throughout this whole thing of the righteousness of God. But he brings in also the righteousness of faith. This whole chapter is really written to the church that is in Rome. Uh, the church that is in Rome, he says, but the righteousness, which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So the righteousness, which is of the law says that if you're going to abide by it, you've got to complete it all. But the righteousness of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Uh huh. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. He said, don't say this in your heart because your heart is going to play a very important part in salvation. He says, but what saith it? What, what saith what? What saith the righteousness of the law? Or the, what saith the righteousness of faith? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Let me start there. The word of faith, which we preach, which means if we don't preach the word of faith, and I believe the 17th verse says faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, or faith comes by hearing the gospel. If we don't preach it, how can they receive faith? And the Bible says when he comes back to earth, will he find faith on the earth? Problem is we're not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preach us. That's our assignment by the Holy Spirit. So the righteousness of the law could not be fulfilled by man. Romans 8 and 3. The law itself was holy, but man could not uphold its demands. Romans 7 and 12. 
The law is spiritual, but man is carnal, sold under sin or unto sin, Romans 7, 14. The law was weak through faith. I'm sorry, through, through the flesh. Whew, that's Romans 8 and 3. Mm -hmm. The righteousness which comes by faith does not say who's going to ascend or who's going to descend. This righteousness that Paul speaks of only comes by faith. Now, Paul quoted from Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verses 11 through 14. You can find that in your spare time. The righteousness of faith says that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. This word Paul speaks of is called the word of faith, which we preached. And the word preach means to herald, to proclaim, or to announce publicly. Matter of fact, we're born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's 1 Peter 1 and 23. And Jesus even told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is the mandate of the preacher. Yes, that's what he told us to do. Uh, now we're getting ready to get in trouble. That if thou shalt confess, now the word is nigh thee, it's in your mouth. That's the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess, watch that word, key word, one of the greatest words in this lesson other than righteousness and the word saved, which means to be delivered from danger into safety. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So number one, Paul starts this chapter by desiring that Israel might be saved. Then he states his reason for saying that they're not saved. He shows them the difference between the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of the faith or of faith. They're going about, he says, to establish their own righteousness. He said they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Then he tells them the way to receive the righteousness of God is by faith. And then he says, don't say in your heart who's going to go up, who's going to go down. But the word is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Here's my struggle. Oftentimes when people come to church, I asked a question in one of our classes about two weeks ago. How do you know that you are saved? How do you know? And let me ask that question. How do you know you're saved according to scripture? Are you really saved? Are we really saved according to scripture? And is our life living up to it? Or is there a struggle? How do you know it? What point was my other question? At what point did you receive salvation? Did you receive it when you walked up there and gave the preacher your hand and God your heart? Or did you receive salvation the minute you put in your heart that you were going to be saved? Did you have to open up your mouth to confess sin? And is that what Paul said when he mentions confession? Because we make people confess sin. Scripture didn't say here, open up your mouth and confess sin. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Now I'm going to show you, you all might leave this channel where Paul technically was talking directly to the Jew because it was the Jew that did not believe in Christ. They didn't accept him as the son of the living God. They accepted him slightly as the Messiah, but they stumbled when he was on the cross. So they had a problem with it. He says, remember when he first started, he says his desire for them is that they be saved. Now he's telling them particularly how they can be saved. So he says, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, 
Now watch this. The word confess is where we mess up. The word confess, homologio, same word. It means to consent, admit, to agree, to acknowledge, or to open, acknowledge openly or profess. In other words, consent or admit or agree. What are you agreeing with? You are agreeing with the fact that Jesus is Lord because the Jew rejected his Lordship. They rejected him. And Paul says, you rejected the wrong thing. You rejected him when you need to reject the law in the day and time that we're living in. And you need to confess that Jesus is Lord. And you need to consent, to admit, to agree, to acknowledge openly or profess. So based on the righteousness of the law, they must live up to the entire law. They cannot break one part of the law's commands or demands. He lays out two main points of the righteousness, which is of faith. They must or shall confess, they shall believe. Paul never said here that they have to confess sin. They were told to confess or profess Christ. I need to say something too. I want y'all to research this. The word I in, I am. In Matthew, I think it is woo, 28, 19, something like that. He says, uh, what Jesus says, go into all the world, and preach the gospel, baptizing them in, I in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then read Acts 2 and 38. Uh, he says, for them to repent, every one of you, for the remission of your sins and be baptized in. The word in, in Acts 2 and 38, and in, in Matthew 28 and 19, verse 20, those are two separate meanings. One means into and one means unto. Prior to him saying that in Acts the second chapter, he says here, O house of Israel, he's talking directly to them. When he tells them to repent, which we mean, think it means always to turn around to have godly sorrow, here Peter was telling them Jews to change your mind, change your thought, and change your view concerning Christ. Here, Paul is telling them to confess with your mouth or publicly or openly that Jesus is Lord. He's the same one you rejected. Because I asked a question, suppose the person can't talk. How do they confess then? Are we sure that confession is only with the mouth? Because he said to agree. Mm, you can nod your head and agree. Ah, I'm in trouble. So they were told to confess or to profess Christ. Uh, the Jew didn't believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior. But Paul tells them in order to be saved, they must make a proclamation. Then lastly, he uses the word believe. He says, believe in that heart that God raised him from the dead. And the word believe is where we get in trouble. When we have people up on the altar, we have them to confess sin. And then we ask them, do you believe? And they say, yes, I believe. And then they walk away. They go outside. They smoke. They drink. They lie. They curse. They swear. They whatever. The lifestyle didn't change. I need you to know that when you are saved, there is a manifestation of the triune God that takes place in your life. The Bible lets us know that you are born again. You are born from above. And your nature changes. Your action changes. Your life changes. The things that you do changes because you now have the seed of God according to first John you got God's DNA you're no longer after the first Adam you are now after the second or last Adam he says to believe where in your heart that means you can't have no doubts about the resurrection of Jesus and the word believe means to have faith in watch this it means to trust it means to entrust and to firmly be persuaded. What are you entrusting? 
to entrust your entire life into his hands. Some of the problems we have with salvation is we only give God a portion of our life and our belief system, but we tell him I'm going to hold on to the rest. And you leave the altar rustling and struggling with it the rest of your life because we refuse to give it over. And the word believe means to have faith in, to be convicted, to be thoroughly convicted, to be fully persuaded, to have faith in, to trust, and to entrust, entrust our life. So if we did not entrust our life into his hands, I question or not whether or not we have done right or wrong. So they must believe God raised Jesus from the dead in order for them to be saved. Remember, he's still talking to the Jew who got who stumbled, and many of them are still looking for the return of Jesus Christ. And he done came here and left. And he's on his way back. Many didn't believe that he rose from the grave. They didn't believe that he got out of the cave or the 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 the, the, the whatever the tomb that he was buried in. They don't believe it. And therefore, Paul is, is talking to Israel as a nation. He says, I'm concerned about my people because they're not saved. But when you get to the 11th chapter, he says, have they been cast away or put off permanently? He says, no, God forbid. Right now, this is the hour for the Gentile, honey. It's our time, baby. That's really what he's saying. If our lesson goes into the 11th chapter and then justification is based on God raising Jesus from the dead. Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 24 through 25. And the Holy Spirit was poured upon those who believe that God raised him from the dead. Acts, the fourth chapter, verses 24, all the way through verses 36. Then he says, thou shalt be saved. Now watch this lastly. He says, for with the heart man believeth, because I know we bring up confession first, but salvation begins from the heart. The day you hear my voice, heart not your heart. And that's why he says, with the heart man believes, he believes. Notice he didn't say he works, but man believes unto righteousness. He's justified by his belief. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, but you only confess that what you believe. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's it. I'm done. I am saved by faith. Listen, I'm going to be in Miami, Florida Tuesday. Yes. Tuesday, the 17th or the 18th through Friday. I'm going to be in Miami. Holla at your boy. If those of you that are going to be there, somebody needs to take me to get something to eat. Maybe you got a Bible study you might want me to zoom in on. Just let me know. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up button. I need you to mash that. Hit that thumbs up. I need to see how many people can hit that thumbs up. Leave me some remarks and let's talk about what is it that you liked about this lesson? What is it that you saw a different kind of way? Share this lesson with your loved one. Share it with your enemy because they need the gospel in their lives as well. And let me know how many of you all on here are Sunday school teachers or Sunday school superintendents. And lastly, give us your Zoom information. Maybe there are people on here that are not having Sunday school and they would like to go into somebody's Sunday school class. All right. Lord, say the same. If the creek don't rise and if the Lord delay is coming, I'll see you all on next week. So we're going to continue in the book of Romans. Uh, chapter 10, verses 11 through 21. 11 through 21. And then we're going to conclude in Romans 15, verses 15 through 27. That's it. You know my motto. Teaching the word of God in the spirit of excellence. And the model of the Sunday school, a child saved is a soul saved plus a life. Amen. Join me. Let's go.